not listen to episode three with my old buddy Gene Jackson. Here's a clip. Download and listen to it. And uh, we we tried to light the rebel flag on fire with Michael Anthony wrapped up in it, and uh, the people took exception to that. Man, what an... You know, I don't even remember that angle. I actually had an angle that I was going to use with the Confederate flag kind of thing, um, and and Mike would never approve of it and was going to use it with CCW after. I was going to take a... Uh, an actual black tag team and have them tag with uh, Southern Pride, and um, at the end of the at the end of the match, I was going to have the black tag team turn on Southern Pride and hang them. So, but for some oh, reason, God. no one wanted to do that. So, you're ahead of your time, Brian, or behind. <laughs> one. I'm not sure which way. I'm not which way you want to look at that. But thank yeah, God I might it didn't be happen. behind there. <laughs> uh, I should have sent that to Cornette at the time. He could have done that with the gangsters there. And, uh, oh, yeah, and, uh, Robert Fuller would have booked it. And Brickhouse would have been right there to do it too. <laughs> uh, that's I'm just when you said Robert Fuller, all I can think of is him with uh, Booker T and uh, them coming out with chains. Now that just uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. You know, I know we've probably talked about this before, but it's one of those things where. Uh, uh, you got a bunch of guys sitting around with an idea, you know. You know, I don't know if I'm putting this out Thursday or Friday, but we're recording it right here Thursday night. I'm sorry for the lateness, guys. We had the Dodgers on TV last night. I've got to pull for the... Uh, for the National League, and we also, I've had a little bit of change of job, so we had Lance and me, we just weren't able to do anything last night, so you'd have a show on schedule, I mean, the late, the very late, brain last, uh, he will love this episode, and already, in the studios, I have my old buddy, Lance Levine, Lance Levine, that's right, I am live from St. Louis, and you are where? Uh, I'm dead from Chicago, Illinois, from the CKC studios in Chicago, Illinois. Actually, my voice probably is shot a little bit because I was screaming at the TV last night due to that baseball game. So, Actually being timely and talking about things that were happening, that's kind of weird, ain't it? Uh, yeah. I just want to put over a few things. Number one, uh, at Comic Book Mark BT, that's me at Twitter. Lance, what's your Twitter handle? Uh, at Chocolatier LL at Twitter, on Twitter. All right, guys. You'll find follow- all my snarky bullshit on there. That's right. Lots of snarky, cunny, Lots, bull- yeah. cunny bullshit. That's right. Um, hashtag cunt. Probably. All right, no further bullshit. Let's do it. We spent a lot of time on this, and Lance is going to talk about it. And Lance, tell us what we're counting down tonight. We have we went a little bit against uh, against type for us here tonight. We have the top ten wrestlers of the 1930s. This is incredible. Um, there's so much good stuff on YouTube. Uh, we did a lot of research. We found a lot of cool clips and everything. So we went full on Tom Burke. We went all Tom Burke on you and shit tonight. And we just want to say before we get started, um, tonight's episode is a very special episode. It's brought to you by the law offices of Park Park and Park. So <laughs> there you go, any... Randy Smith. There you That's go. That's right, Randy. Uh, Dick Shillington is a proud member, a proud listener of of CKC or <laughs> CCK or whatever the fuck it is. I'm dyslexic tonight. The fucking Dodgers has me off the cuff. So anyway. Dodgers! Uh, so we put together our top ten list like we always do, and we had a couple people that we disagreed on, and so a couple wild cards are in there. So our top ten wrestlers of the 30s starts off with your wild card, BT. Your wild card is one Nick Patron. Nick Patron, yeah, that's right. That's my wild card. You know, uh, Nick would come to the ring, and almost no one could understand him. I know there's a few things. Lance, you always know things, but there's some stuff that you just don't know and you don't know this by nick about nick he actually could speak more english than he played it was he was kayfabing everyone uh i talked to a few people that worked with nick and they said he called the moves just like anyone else in the ring uh but he just kayfabe kayfabe was strong back then a total ring technician. Uh, if you think daniel bryan today that's nick patron right there and here's something he pissed more people off because 
he was a little stiff in the ring, and he wouldn't talk to anyone. And I got one thing that you, there's no way you found out on the internet about him. I'm going to try to have something about each one of these guys. <laughs> but that's right. You can't Good luck. find this. Good luck. You, I did my research, too. You did not know this, but Nick Patron loved redheads. Interesting. Yep, yep. So, Nick Patron, uh, just not a fan of the guy. I mean, I thought he was just awful. I mean, the fact that he could not speak English. Now, you can say he was kayfabing, but I, honest to God, believe that that guy could not speak English. Um, he was decent in the ring, good technical style. Uh, obviously, he was a huge star in Sicily before he came to the States, but I, I just didn't think it translated. It just did not carry over. And I'll tell you what, you know, I'm not a fan of the hot potatoing with the titles the way they do today, but he held that goddamn Inter-America's title for six goddamn years, six straight years of one guy, and fucking Nick Patron, of all people, holding that title. The guy's style was just way too technical. Technical, just not at all exciting. I don't know what people. I don't know what you saw on him, to be honest. I don't know what the fans saw on him back him, in the day. But and the he, fact that he was handsome too. The guy could not speak English at all, and I'm like, what? A, now that you're telling me that that he actually did speak English and just kayfaved it, now it's even more frustrating. So for sure, Nick Patron, not anywhere near my top ten. But our top ten, just based on your wild card vote, at number nine is my wild card, and that is the lovely Tweety Peters. Oh, no. Tweety Peters, huh? You know, most people will remember who Tweety Peters is. Um, because her entire gimmick was like a fucking bird. No, I know. She wasn't a bird. But uh, this was Bailey before it was Bailey. Tire tire gimmick was her uh, being everyone's friend. And she's she's their buddy. She's their pal. And uh, they pushed her big, you know. And I just, I didn't think she was that talented. You loved her. I didn't think she was even that hot. So, uh, but, you know, she could have mid-card good matches. uh, But when it came to the big stage, they they never stuck her in the main event. They never done anything like that because uh, she couldn't hang with the main event girls. And the thing I know about her, she was into ball-headed guys. So there you go. She would have loved me, but I hated her. There you go. Wow, you really did do some research here. Tweety Peters, my wild card, for sure. I don't know how you couldn't have her ranked any higher than than not even having her on your list. If it wasn't for her, there would be no Bailey, like you said. The, The whole entire Bailey act is derived from Tweety Peters. So I don't understand... Why she doesn't get, you know, in all of the interviews with Bailey and all of the different promos that you see and everything, it's the exact same character, the sweet girl next door character. Where it went wrong, and I think this is where her career career started ta- tail spinning, was the fact that she married Billy Stein, and we know what Billy Stein was doing back in the day, uh, did not end well because, you know, what his effect on women's wrestling was back then, you know how that went, uh, did not end well. Uh, Sad ending to her wrestling career. She ended up working in circuses. She ended up being a sideshow act. I think she did the bearded lady gimmick at one point, uh, guessing the weight and all the kind of bullshit in the carnivals and circuses. So, But as far as I'm concerned, for the 12 years that she wrestled, Tweety Peters was a sure Hall of Famer. I don't understand how she doesn't get the recognition that she truly deserves because, like I said, big influence on, on uh, all the women wrestling today. So that are, those are our two wild cards. At number eight, now we start getting into the guys we agreed upon. So at number eight, we have Lonesome, Lonesome Joe Daniels. Lonesome Joe Daniels. Hey, he was one of the first guys ever to do the cowboy gimmick, and it was almost a shoot because uh, Lonesome Joe was from Houston, Texas, had that big uh, swagger and had that big cowboy hat and even had uh, – and his gimmick was, I love this. I absolutely love this, Lance, and you, I know you'll remember this. Mm-hmm. It's, it's when he would bring the spur, put it on the one boot, tap it, and boom, hit people in the head with it for mm-hmm. the win. Now, everyone hated that. Great heel. And he also, not only was he a cowboy, he was a singing cowboy. So who can't like a singing cowboy? People booed the shit out of this guy, and that's what I like most about him. Uh, I like it because he was, you know, I, I don't know. When I think of Joe, I think uh, maybe the Terry Funk with the cowboy hat. He was just rough and tough. And and, uh, and what I hear, he was rough and tough in real life. Uh, and the little known fact about Lonesome Joe Daniels, his favorite cough drop was cherry. Interesting. There you go. Wow. Yes, yes. 
Well, I like to call him LJD. Uh, LJD, a little known fact that you don't know, apparently you didn't find this out in your research, was that he worked Memphis. He did do the country singer gimmick. That was what he was obviously most known for. He worked Memphis initially. But he as a baby face, he was he worked Memphis as a face. But then he did that famous heel turn, and I what I noticed was that they suddenly billed him from Texas. So there was that automatic heat between Tennessee and Texas. You know the Cowboys from one the Southern boys. You know they hated the Texans and the Texans hated the Tennessee guys. So I thought that was interesting that they they went to that extreme with the gimmick. Uh, I think Elias takes a lot of his gimmick from Lonesome Joe. Uh, the most memorable bit for me, you remembered the spur thing, and that was a great bit too. But for me, the memorable bit that Joe did was when he would ride. He his gimmick was he rode to the ring on the horse, and there was the one instance where I think it happened in Nashville where the horse threw him, and thankfully he didn't get hurt. But the horse threw him, and then the horse. And there's, this is on video. If you look on YouTube, right, right. You'll find That's this. what I was six to say. You guys have to look. Yeah, at this you got to look for this because the horse throws him, and immediately after the horse throws him, the horse takes a dump in the arena, which is classic, <laughs> classic stuff. So, and the other, the other thing that I really loved with Lonesome Joe is he actually did record a single. It was called Lonesome Stew. And it actually charted. So very, very strong. Lonesome Joe Daniels, very strong at number eight for us. At number seven, we agreed. I think we both had him ranked about the same spot. We have Hank the Tank Seward. Hank the Tank. Hank the Tank. Oh. So think about this. Uh, big guy, you're talking about 350 pounds. And I mean just almost as round as he was tall. Uh and, and, you know, he was a big old boy, let me say. But I loved Hank the Tank. I mean, the whole deal where he was the army man, he was the tank. I mean, it's kind of cheesy. But, you know, wearing the big green camouflage suit. And, uh, you know, he's the one that started the five count. So so just like King Kong Bundy, you, you instead of counting one, two, three, Hank the Tank made you count to five to defeat his opponents. Um Man, I can't say enough good things about Hank the Tank. Uh, hey, I have uh, seen some really crazy pictures of him in some weird places. Uh, I don't even know if we want to talk about this, but kind of like in uh, uh, down in the hood, if I want to say. Maybe, <laughs> maybe just really strange. But other than that, a uh, great guy. He's, everyone seemed to like him. And uh, here's the fact about him that you don't know. There's no way you found out about this. Hank the Tank was an excellent cook. You are a research maven. I know, tonight. I know. A lot of research this week. Man, this is a lot of work. I hope people realize how much work went into this list this time, especially on your part. You're showing me. So anyway, Hank the Tank Seward, excellent big man. Uh, he had that army gimmick. Uh, it, it, it hit, that gimmick exploded because of the heightened patriotism, obviously, back in the 30s. I mean, he had such a big following. And you had mentioned the uh, when he wrestled with the camouflage, but he also was the pioneer of the red, white, and blue singlet. He was also the first guy that I that I can, in my research, that I found that had the red, white, and blue singlet. Uh, the thing that really stood out with him was how he got over doing the Pledge of Allegiance at the start of every match and it just got everybody in the crowd. If you look at some of the clips, you'll see everybody in the crowd is standing with their hands on their heart, and they're literally doing the Pledge of Allegiance. I think uh, Zeb Coulter maybe got some of his gimmick from that. So he did the pledge, and then I think what you didn't mention was when he turned and he became a German sympathizer. I think that was one of the most red-hot turns I've ever seen in wrestling. Uh, it was amazing how the fans just suddenly got so against him, and nobody was behind him any longer because he suddenly became a German sympathizer. Uh, and I think if you – obviously, the end of his career was when he got stabbed at that house show in St. Louis. I think that was because those American fans were so pissed off about that turn to become, you know, to side with the Germans. So Hank the Tank Seward, a really entertaining guy from the 30s at number seven. Looking, yeah, you're looking at, you know, back then the security, they didn't ever expect anyone, uh, even though more people believed than they believe now, mm -hmm. uh, at no time did they really expect anyone to come out of the crowd with a knife. And it yeah. was, I mean, that was pretty much the end of his career. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, where are we at? What number? Uh, we are at number six, and at number six, this one was one that I ranked a little higher than you did. You had him towards the bottom, but we have Chico Escobar, Panama Madman. <laughs> I I did, but you know, it was uh, to me, Chico was all a gimmick, and he's one of those guys where, oh 
God. The wild hair, uh, you know, the bone through the nose, which I have no idea what that had to do with, uh, you know, Chico Escobar. Uh, he was from from uh, the madman, you know. So I don't know. The bone through the uh, nose, and then he had the big crazy hair. Uh, what he reminded me of, I hate to, re- you know, talk about another wrestler now, but think of, think of the ultimate warrior and his working ability. Uh, but also being able to see him be as popular as the Ultimate Warrior was. That mm. was one thing. And popular as in the heel, but he was. I mean, he made the money for every promoter he worked for. People hated him, and he came off as a crazy man. Great freaking brawler. Uh, you know, think Bruiser Brody uh, and Cactus Jack all rolled up into one. Uh, and that's why I said he wasn't a good wrestler. He was a good worker. Mm-hmm. Uh, something that you – I think you even noted this, but he – his link, how you like that? His mm. link to now was that he actually had a big feud with the missing Link's dad. Mm-hmm. That was that's not a you know I'm, most people know that fact. I can't have all those good facts. Now. Yeah, that one was obvious. Uh, my favorite wild man of all time, uh, Chico Escobar, definitely my favorite wild man of oh, all wow. time. He was, and I mean, you kind of you know you kind of stole my thunder. He was Bruiser Brody before Bruiser Brody. He had the wild hair, he had the boots, he had the chain, and uh, the 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 big thing, the big difference for me with Chico Escobar, what made the act was obviously his manager, Stu Needleman, was a Amazing on the microphone. Uh, he led him to the ring. Needleman was just such a great talker. Led him to the ring on that chain. Uh, the fans literally running away from this guy. They were, you know, it's not like today when you see the girl twerking when Shane McMahon is coming down the stairs. You know, people aren't afraid of wrestlers the way they were in the 30s. You know, uh, that girl, that hot Asian girl twerking in front of Shane just ruined it. So, but people would literally run away screaming. You would see women in this black and white footage. You would see rim- women running away. From and men too, for that matter, running away from Chico Escobar because they were afraid that the Panama Madman was going to hurt him. Uh, the biggest thing that got him over, and I think you probably saw this, but the biggest thing that got him over was that video of him literally choking out a calf. And I honestly, I don't know to this day, I don't know if it was a work, if it was true, but all I know is back then it looked like he literally had choked out this calf. And at that point, his career just blew up as being the the Panama Madman, the crazy heel that he was at that time. Well, he at, did something that people believe. And that's the thing, you know, we, we can sit and bitch about, uh, you know, today's wrestling and all this flip and flop and horse shit, but, uh, which I love. Mm-hmm. But here we go. He did something that people believed, which yeah. made his career so much more important by, you know, just putting his hands around a, a, a calf's neck. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, and you think he choked it out. I mean, uh, who uh, knows? Hell, I don't know. I, no one's ever said whether that's uh, legit or it was. Uh, that's uh, one of those wrestling, word. one of those wrestling mysteries like Jimmy Snuka. You know, we'll probably never know the answer on that calf. And don't ever let it be understated or overstated, rather, that the importance of Stu Needleman in the getting Chico Escobar over because that I act agree, yeah. is amazing. So at number five, my friend, we have the beautiful Phoebe Starr. Oh man, we can't. Me and you got to agree on this girl mm-hmm. now. Uh, you know, not always. You know, my kind of women. I like the BBWs and everything, but Phoebe was gorgeous. Oh, stunning! Just, be- just stunning. Just beautiful. And the thing about it was, and, and we probably got her higher than anyone else because you know she makes her dick hard. Other than that, but not <laughs> only that. Hey, Lance, you know, she was a hell of a worker. A lot of people are very mm-hmm. underrated. Uh, I bet no one else that did the list, did this list that we did, mm-hmm. and no one else would put her this high. But I think both of us totally agree. Number five is easy with her. Um, and, and here's the thing that she liked. She liked ball-headed guys that wore glasses. <laughs> No, I don't know that. I didn't have anything about Phoebe. She was a lot secretive and yeah. and, and, and kayfabed a lot, so we didn't really know. Uh, there was rumors that she dated one of the guys and blah, 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 and then there was rumors that she, well, she liked dating a girl. So uh, I, who the uh, hell knows? Yeah. So. I got to the bottom of the Phoebe Star story. <laughs> All right, so. well, let us know. What'd you, what do you so, think about Phoebe? I am going to say, in my opinion, and again, only my opinion, the most underrated woman ever in the history of pro wrestling. Uh, there would be no female wrestling today if it wasn't for Phoebe Starr. 
absolutely stunning, breathtaking. You know, now, of course, you know, times have changed and, you know, the, the standards of beauty have changed. So if we looked at her now, she would look like a, you know, a, a load now, a potato sack. But back for the 30s, she was hot. She was gorgeous. And the thing was, like you referenced, she was technically gifted, just so strong in the ring. And she was a high flyer, too. So she really combined all the elements of what really makes a star. And hey, let's face it, she's number five on our list. That's the highest woman that we've got for the 30s. So she went, of course, she went in the Hall of Fame in 2006. At that point, obviously, in my opinion, was way overdue, long overdue. Uh, And again, you know, that son of a bitch, Billy Stein, comes into play again. He wanted to marry her. He was going to leave whoever he was with at the time. Yeah, yeah, the Billy Stein story that guy got around but here's the thing and you kind of you kind of referenced it you had a theory she was indeed gay and so she turned down the billy stein advances nobody knew it was completely kayfabe at the time but you know they had to keep her image up because she was such a heartthrob to all the men the male fans so stein at that time stein tried to blackball her uh, but honestly, it was like much like Daniel Bryan. The fans got her over. The fans made her. So no matter what his efforts were to try to ruin her career, it didn't matter. Uh, she retired successfully, did a few movies. She transitioned a little bit to Hollywood, did a few movies. High point of her acting career definitely was the nomination. She was nominated for an Emmy for Perry Mason guest shot in 1951, I believe it was. Oh, wow. So, Let's yeah, see. Best Supporting Actress nominee. So that was the high point of Phoebe Stone. And by the, way, yeah. she, by the way, she was an older lady at the time. And let me just say, I would have still did her at that time, too. So, go ahead. You'd still yeah. do her now. <laughs> She's 94. Oh. All right. Who All right. we got next? At number four, we go to the guy I like to call Triple J. He is Jumping James Jeffers. Jumping James Jeffers, you know, um, I guess, you know, no one can dispute this, although we hear stuff later in in the history here, uh, Triple J uh, was uh, actually invented the flying dropkick, so he was the first guy uh, during, and they said this was during training, uh, decided that he was going to jump up with his two feet and hit a guy in the head, Uh and at that time, when you was uh, you know transitioning from more working than it was shoot going on, this was totally different. He was the, let me say, he was the flipping flopping horseshit back then. You know, uh, jumping up in the air, doing a drop kick, uh, not really graceful, but and just popular. That's the reason he's so, uh, you know, up here so high in the sense that that there was he was drawing some really good money. Uh, you know, with uh, three or four different feuds, and almost every place, well, not almost, every place he went and did a couple of flying flips, uh, something different that the fans had never seen, he was over. I mean, went from, if they put him on the uh, the front of the card, and he went out there and did that first match, uh, you know, two or three weeks later, he was feuding against the top heel on top. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, has to be included in, in, in the top four here. Well, this is one where we disagreed slightly because I had him at number two. I re- you called him sloppy. I I don't know what you saw. I don't. Know, you must have seen some clips that I didn't see because this guy was smooth as silk. Uh, like you said, he invented the drop kick. I heard some mixed stories on that. I heard he invented it, and then I heard also that it was invented by accident. He slipped on something and invented it that way. So I don't know. There's a little bit of discrepancy on the story on that, but. What I loved about Jumpin' James is that he, you know, he went against the grain at the time. It was such a plodding technical style. It was also Matt based, you know, your goddamn Nick Patron, that fucker. I can't, I couldn't stand that guy. You know, everything was so Matt based and so, uh, you know, just technical and borderline boring with some of those guys. But then Triple J came along and revolutionized the industry. He was by far the most athletic guy of that era. Uh, He obviously, everybody knows he came from the Wake Forest gymnastics team and he transitioned to being a wrestler from there. Uh, If you listen to any interviews with Ricochet and Rey Mysterio, those guys are huge fans of Triple J. Uh, A lot of their style patterned after the the jumping James Jeffers. Uh, And also there was that, again, this is, I apologize, fans, we don't have all the details on the falling out that he had with jumping Jim Brunzel because jumping Jim Brunzel that trained under Jeffers 
uh, learned a lot of his ways from James Jeffers, but there was some kind of falling out. We never did get to the bottom of that. Uh, something over money. I think it was over money. I don't think it was over a woman or anything, but jumping Jim Brunzel, again, patterned his whole act pretty much off of jumping James Jeffers. So triple, triple J at number four on our list. That's why I keep saying triple J, because jumping James Jeffers, jumping James, that's hard. Yeah, to it's tough to man. say. Yeah, All exactly. All right, now here comes the top, right, this is top three, right? Yeah, top three, and like right. we've said this before, with some of our other lists, uh, honestly, they're all interchangeable. You know, there's no really wrong answer. Number three, you know, could have been number one. So all three of these guys are your top stars from the 30s. Uh, at number three, we start off with Tom Hydrant Hightower. And, you know, uh, I always have to do a shout-out here because, you know, this guy is Jim Vicious's favorite wrestler during this era. So fuck you, Jim Vicious. He's at number three, not at number one. <laughs> <laughs> it's Tim Hydra Hightower, and I can't even say his fucking name. Guess what? Just guess what his gimmick was. You had him, uh, I, I guess three, being such a good worker, but this fucking gimmick killed me sometimes. He was a fireman. Uh, he came out with the whole gimmick, uh, and <laughs> I, I can't believe they did what they did when he turned heel. Uh, but there's something about... Uh, all right, so what they did was when he turned heel, he was known to have started fires, okay? Here was a fireman, and now he's starting fires around the uh, arena. Uh, they had one incident where someone got trampled and broke their leg or something. Here's the part I hated when he was a babyface. It's when they bring that fucking dog out, that fucking <laughs> Dalmatian. I know, he's one of the top guys, uh, but it's just like when you get sick of something Ric Flair did, you know? Uh, that fucking dog was so stupid, and the only reason they did that is so that they could, you know, sell gimmicks of the dog, you know. Uh, so yeah, number three, I don't even have anything secret about him, but yeah, uh, yeah. the fire gimmick when he turned heel was kind of funny, you know, putting fires everywhere, but but uh, kind of controversial too. You know, I didn't even realize you just touched on a good point. The the Pee Wee the dog merchandise is the forerunner of Daryl Takahashi today there you go you know, if right you think there, about yep. it so i mean they did sell for that day you know for obviously in the 30s they were selling those stuffed dogs at like you know whatever it was a dime or whatever for the gimmicks at that point but they made a fortune off of tom hydrant hightower's dog gimmick so i actually love the fireman gimmick i thought it was cheesy as hell uh the fans adored him because he was like the prototypical public servant uh you know there was there's been cops there's been soldiers there's been other various you know prototypical servant jobs and the fans just ate him up um I think what really got him over was the fact that he did actually go out on some fire calls and actually served as a fireman here and there. He was like a part-time fireman. He got burned on the foot on one of those calls. It nearly ended his career. So I think they had to, you know, they taped him up. They covered him in gauze and ointment to, to make sure that he could actually still work because obviously back in those days, those guys were making, what, five bucks a show, and this guy was working six shows a night. So, I mean, he did not have the luxury have taken any time off so but i'll agree with you that heel turn nearly killed him uh i don't think the fans bought him when they turned him into the arsonist i don't think that it, it just it went downhill from there but i'll tell you i had to rank him highly because his baby face run was so strong it was one of the strongest runs of the 30s so tom hydrant hightower at number three I Taking think a, the, thing, to, hold on. Uh -huh. the thing that the people it didn't work and they got pissed off was that he still worked as a fireman so it was almost like, yeah. you know, the kayfabe was, everyone found out, you know, newspapers would have him listed, uh, you know, that, that he helped on a fire. Mm -hmm. uh, although he, you know, was running around here setting a fire in dressing rooms and, and a trash can around the ring and stuff like that. So I think that's the reason that part didn't get over. And then that fucking dog. Uh, all right, go so ahead. At, uh, <laughs> and it's a good thing there was no internet back then because that fireman gimmick would have been over. But the, the, the telegraph... Oh, wait, wait, wait. We forgot to mention what what uh, move he invented. To carry, obviously. The, there we go. See? Yeah. I mean, we, we just looked over that. Okay, That's all right. That's probably right. why Come we have him so high on the list because he invented, invented the fireman's carry. So good, well, good call. Well, part of that and just that gimmick was so over, I think the controversial part of him turning heel. Yeah. Man, I could sit here and talk about him all night. Yeah. He, the thing about it was, and you know how... He was a damn good looking guy, you know, with the hair on the chest, the whole nine yards. And, and uh, but um, 
just not. I mean, he has to be one of the top three, four, five, and he ended up in top three. Yeah. Bars. Well, Tim Hightower, not my type. I'm more of a Tweety Peters guy, as we know. Oh, so okay, anyway, right. moving on, getting back to the list here, we are at number two, and number two we agreed is Cowboy Ken. You know, what I found weird after we sat here and uh, did this list, you sent it to me. I didn't say a word about it. Uh, it looks like we ended up with two guys. I mean, you got uh, LJD, you know, he did the cowboy gimmick, and then we got uh, Cowboy Ken. Uh, LJD was, uh, I said he was big, rugged. He was a great brawler. Uh, he had that guitar, which did the singing gimmick. Now, when it ca- come to uh, Cowboy Ken, here's the thing, and everyone knew it, total shoot. He fucking yeah. was from the rodeo, yep. uh, and they the, when they would show those uh, those clips of the in the newspaper where he was on the bull and and, and all the horse shit and then I mean it was horse shit back then, I, but it actually was shoot. So people got into him because his stuff was real. Uh, I love the gimmick that they did with uh, I don't know if you remember I don't know if you remember this mm-hmm. Lance the gimmick they did with the clowns. Uh, and I just <laughs> totally forgot to about the day, clowns. Look for that on YouTube. That's fucking awesome. Still yeah. to this day is a great uh, Cowboy Ken number two. I agree one hundred percent. I said, in my opinion, Cowboy Ken represents the greatest transition ever, and I'm not referencing Caitlyn Jenner. That is not a Caitlyn Jenner joke, but the greatest transition <laughs> ever. Literally walking from the rodeo into wrestling with almost no training needed whatsoever. Um, he just took to it. You know, it's one of those things. He just took to it so naturally. He he had the athletic background from the rodeo, literally trained for a couple of days until he had a match with, of all people, Lou Fez. He, it, his first match working for Tootsmont, as you know, was against Fez. And it's still to this day, 2017. Cowboy Ken and Luthez is still viewed as a classic. So I thought the roping gimmicks were amazing. Uh, he would rope the fans in the front row, and it would get over with people. The kids loved the guy. He was just an enthralling act altogether. Uh, and when you say horseshit, I get the no pun intended, right? Cowboy <laughs> horseshit. Hey, I got the it. way I look at it, too, it's really weird how the two of the top baby faces ever in that in that 10 years of the 30s, you know, that, that uh, what uh, – who would ever believe that me and you would be picking baby faces? And the number one, go ahead. Everyone uh, knows who number one is now. Because of course. We, yeah. Of course. Hell, but I got to wrap up the on Cowboy Ken. The one thing that did piss me off was that that promoter, that Saul Silver, brought in that midget and called that midget Cowboy Ken. And that was just so insulting and so infuriating to me. I thought it was just a slap in the face to one of the all-time greats. So fuck you, Saul Silver, in posterity for naming a midget after Cowboy Ken. You know, Cowboy Ken was a legend. So at number one, obviously, again, like you said, there's no surprise here because we've named everybody else already. So obviously at number one is Wolfgang Von Klemper. After I mean, who wouldn't vote him? I mean, I could see people saying, "Yeah, well, he was, you know, he did the, a stupid gimmick." But you know what? He was I, he wasn't the best worker, uh, best wrestler, best anything. But he was the best over round, totally over. He came in as the Nazi heel, mm-hmm. like uh, like everyone uh, wanted to hate. Uh, then we ended up some of the goofiest shit that he did. Uh, it's just like, uh, what was that show? Hogan's Hero. Yep. Uh, it was just like the comedy that they would do there. Uh, would never be funny these days. Uh, but he was absolutely I, decent in the ring, but the gimmick was awesome. Uh, and the one thing I know about him, he was really a Nazi. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he lived the gimmick. So, like you said, uh, he's looked back on as being one of the most polarizing figures because the whole idea of a comedy Nazi character, I think, honestly, I'm pretty sure that Hogan's Heroes got the idea from Wolfgang von Klemper. Um, and honestly, I, I think you're that. underselling his in-ring. I, think, I thought his in-ring was good. Uh, he started as a heel, obviously, with the monocle and the cane. Uh, he started as a heel, but gradually the fans started coming around to him. He just was indirectly winning him over. He, he w- certainly wasn't trying, but a charming personality. Uh, he just, the old school fans, what was so funny about watching it is you would see men in the audience that were just these old school fans in the 30s that would never accept, you know, this German guy, this Nazi guy as a baby face or as a comedy character. But you would see a good majority of the 
audience really getting into him. And he was just such a likable, charismatic guy. That's the thing. And, you know, the thing with me is we've said it on the show a number of times. Comedy, for me, comedy and wrestling, all I ask is one thing and that it's funny. If it sucks, then it's not comedy. It's not good. It's not entertaining. But he would come to the ring with those goddamn whoopee cushions and the rubber chickens. I'll never forget the rubber chickens that he would come to the ring with and the whoopee cushions. And honestly, I think he's a pioneer for, like, the Young Bucks because – his catchphrase, I swear to God, if he had T-shirts back then, like the Young Bucks are doing now, that is the truth, son, would be, you know, a hashtag. That is the truth, son, was his line. That was his catchphrase on every fucking T-shirt worldwide. Do that one more it. time. Do that one more time with the German accent. Go ahead. That is the truth, son. <laughs> so at number one, of course, if there, as if there could be any other choice, our top ten wrestlers of the 30s, Wolfgang von Klemper. Wow, that was really fun. Lance, thanks for joining me tonight. Uh, now here on a Thursday night, you may get to listen to it Thursday or Friday. Hell, we might put it out in three weeks. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, this ain't 605. Apolog- It'll go out tonight. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I do apologize for the lateness. Uh, and I want to thank Lance for joining me this week. Uh let us know what you thought about the guys in the 30s. We're, we're thinking about doing some uh, 1920s or, or, or the 40s or whatever we do. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for joining us here on the best little wrestling podcast in the... In the business, I think. In the business! In the business! Same bat time, same bat channel! She said...